you have given us so many good things. You've set our feet on these beautiful shores. And you call us to give an account for what we do with our hands, with, with the time you have given us. We ask for your help and your blessings as we wade through this recent election process. We ask that you forgive us for thinking your love is a zero sum equation where we hold harm, we're held harmless in loving only those who think, speak, or vote like us. Forgive us for refusing to let go of the hopelessness found in hypocrisies and untruths. Forgive us for partisanship and for fearing your call to love all your children. Forgive us for tending poorly to one another, separating from one another, dividing prematurely those worthy and those lost. Give us hope, O oh Lord, that you know and you are in this mess. As we powerfully proclaim that you are not a God of darkness and chaos, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to participate in this beautiful exercise of democracy. Give love to us, O oh Lord, as we deepen our need to love one another. Remind us that you, not our candidates, are the fount of all holiness. Let us recall with humility our own sins as we remember that all are welcome at your table. Open our hearts to new days. <clears throat> Give us wisdom when confronted with new ideas. And help us to remember to pray for those who will be in charge of directing this country when the new term begins. Guide us as we separate what is good and beautiful and true from the rubbish and noise of all that is coming. Ignite in us the holy desire to carry out your work regardless of the end outcomes. Give us mercy, O oh Lord, to lose with dignity and win with compassion, remembering that all those on the ballot were made in your image. Let us rise again each day with an urgency to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to clothe the naked, to bury the dead, to shelter the traveler, to comfort the sick, and to set the captive free. See in us, Holy Father, what you love in your Son, as we offer great thanks that our citizenship in heaven will never rest on our political allegiances, but on the sacrifice of the cross. Remind us of the promise of your salvation as you bestow upon this land your protection and your guidance. We give you this day and each day shelter and bless this country that we love. We pray especially this morning for all those who are suffering from the coronavirus and for every other kind of bodily challenge, and for those who care for them. Heal and restore the sick, we pray, and help those who are assisting them to be instruments of your love. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Hear our prayer. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Hold our beloved states in your hands. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. In the name of Jesus, we pray, who gave this prayer to his followers. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have Juliet here. Time for children's message. Good morning, Juliet. I love things that rhyme. So as I was thinking today about what I would share, you know, you've heard that we just came through an election. You're too young to vote yet, Julia, but one of these days you will, you will vote. And you might think that the people that were running were the most important people in the world. <clears throat> but there's a more important relationship and I wanted to share that with this story called Two Houses, reminding us that more important than any person in power in this world is Jesus, our God who reigns in heaven and on earth. So hear this story. A wise man looked until he found a firm and solid piece of ground. On that rock, so strong and hard, he built a sturdy house and yard on the rock. Then the wild wind blew and the waves grew high and lightning flashed across the sky. It rained and it poured the whole day long, but the house on the rock stood firm and sound didn't blow away. A foolish man found a dandy place with a lovely view and a lot of space. And he built his house on the shifting sand and was quickly done with his house and land. Built a big, beautiful house on sand. Then the wild winds blew and the waves grew high and lightning flashed across the sky. It rained and it poured the live long day. And what happened? The house on the sand was washed away. So the Bible tells us, don't be like the foolish man and build your life on shifting sand. Listen and do the things I say, and this is Jesus talking, and you'll grow wiser every day. Jesus, our best hope, our great leader, let's follow Jesus through this coming day and however long God gives us. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Pastor Gloria. Uh, before this morning, before we uh, hear our scripture reading, I'm going to share uh, something from our, uh, a few pictures, uh, mostly from our preschool. Uh, as you may recall, Halloween was uh, just recently with us. Other people dressed up too. <laughs> this is... Uh, this is uh, Gene Kaneshiro, Mr. L.A. Dodgers. <laughs> yeah, I thought I thought you would uh, you might enjoy seeing uh, Gene in, in his glory. Meanwhile, back at the church, our four amigos have been busy. Four amigos and Ryan. This is uh, Ed Suyoka uh, securing. Uh, the uh, some of the cables that run between the church building and the CE building. Um, Ed is not afraid of heights, as you can see. <laughs> also, uh, the four amigos. This is uh, 
June Kumagai and Ed up on the balcony and uh, Wayne Tadaki below and out of the frame was uh, Ryan again. Uh, they're uh, working on uh, the balconies of the CE building to uh, secure uh, the areas that are particularly uh, flimsy at this point. And the flowers continue to bloom around the, the sanctuary. So the church is still here. Our scripture reader this morning is Conrad. Pastor Wayne, I don't think Conrad is uh, logged in yet. Oh, okay. Uh, it's a very short passage. <laughs> Yep, I can read it. Thanks. But Matthew 6, 33, 34. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. <laughs> Thanks, Jody. Well, what a week it's been. I think this is definitely the most stressful and the strangest election that I've seen in my lifetime. And I wonder how you felt on election night uh, when it became clear we were not going to see a landslide. I found my own feelings expressed really well by a young man named Zach, who worked for the Lincoln Project that group of former Republicans who turned against the president. This young man speaking late on election night said that the failure of the election to soundly repudiate Trumpism, in spite of four years of seeing all that it stands for, was, quote, profoundly disappointing on every level. This young man in a weary and dejected voice said, we are not a nation in decline, we are a nation that has declined. We should all be ashamed of where we are as a country. And to be honest, at the time, I resonated with how he was feeling. The puzzling thing for many of us is how Trump's base has always consisted mostly of self-identifying evangelical Christians. I know there are some in this church, and I'm not here to judge anyone on how they vote. But this fact, this overwhelming fact, makes this political phenomenon a truly spiritual issue, a question for the church. We know there are some issues that account for his popularity, be it abortion rights, gay marriage, Israel, or immigration. But there are a lot of negatives that you have to stomach to vote for this guy, and his supporters often acknowledge this. That didn't stop more than nearly 70 million people, most of whom were evangelicals, from voting for four more years. Well, for four years, I've tried to understand why this unlikely president has such loyalty from so many conservative Christians. And no one I found was really able to explain this unflinching support until just recently when I learned something that has transformed my way of viewing our political scene. It's finally enabled me to feel like I'm beginning to understand why things are the way they are. But even more, it has given me reason to hope rather than to lose hope. And this is what I wanna share with you this morning in a kind of uh, un unexpected election uh, reflection. I was actually supposed to be preaching on Joshua 24 today. Um, that, that will uh, come in a couple of weeks. But what I learned comes from a young man named Joel Edward Goza. That's an Italian Goza, not a Japanese Goza, although it's spelled the same. This young man lives in Houston, went to seminary at Duke Divinity School, and has written a book called America's Unholy Ghosts. 
the racist roots of our faith and politics. He puts some familiar pieces together in a way I'd never seen before. He points out that when America was being formed, the church in this country narrowed the meaning of salvation to refer only to individuals, what he calls soul salvation. And all of us live with the consequences. All of us have heard the gospel defined as receiving Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, saving your soul. The problem, Goza points out, is that according to the Bible, the good news is so much more. Jesus, in his inaugural sermon in Nazareth, does not say, here I am, now receive me as your Lord and Savior. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The year of the Lord's favor meant the year of Jubilee, a time of revolutionary social restructuring between the rich and the poor, forgiving debts, returning family land, good news, especially for the neediest among us. Soul salvation, in fact, is not so easy to find just reading the Bible on your own. This narrowing of the gospel was part of the far-reaching influence of the Enlightenment taking place at the same time. This is Goza's th thesis. And just like oil and energy resources are formative to our life today, back in those centuries, slavery was the energy source that many European countries and America depended on. The creation of our gospel of saving souls, it turns out, had a lot to do with Christians wanting to keep slaves in America. What the church wanted, Goza says, was a church where our slaves could sit in the balconies of churches, where we could save their souls and yet still keep them enslaved. By defining the gospel as soul salvation, not social reformation, slave-owning Christians could avoid the Bible's clear and compelling message that is heard in the Exodus story through the prophets all the way to Jesus and Paul, the message of justice, equality, and freedom, the message of jubilee, salvation for all of society, not just individuals to be in their personal relationships with God. Of course, the prophetic message was what the slaves took as their gospel, and that is why in the black church of yesterday and today, the gospel of social justice is central to their understanding of the good news. I had never thought of all of this in this way till about a month ago when I came across Joel Goza online. His work threw new light on our paradox of mostly white evangelicals supporting a president who divides people and welcomes support from white supremacists. It helped me see that actually we shouldn't be surprised by what we saw in our election results last week. You could even say that the results were embedded in the DNA of the American church. This may shock you, but for me, it was a real aha moment because it makes sense of what up to now has seemed inexplicable. What we see today traces back to the origin of the white American church. Today, we have a better idea of what the gospel is. Our church's vision portrait offers one example. It doesn't limit salvation to individual personal terms. It's focused on our being the church, the body of Christ. Jesus calls disciples, not as lone rangers, but as brothers and sisters to be formed as a community of faith that demonstrates life as it should be and helps to make up there, come down here. Or as we have been saying more recently, our salvation is for the life of the world. Joel Goza says what the white church needs is to embrace the black church with its gospel of justice and righteousness. What the white church needs is to embrace the people it originally and persistently has disenfranchised. Some of you may recall that when we were working on our vision during the new creation process, we learned how much the culture of our secular world had crept into the church, so much so that the church in many ways walked like the world, talked like the world, looked like the world. 
we began to understand how the world had crept into the church and subverted biblical values and practices, like with win-lose voting and slavish devotion to Robert's rules of order. Joel Goza's book, America's Unholy Ghosts, talks about the same problem on a bigger scale. For example, where the Bible's most frequent message is fear not, in Thomas Hobbes, the Enlightenment philosopher who shaped our modern politics, we find a very different attitude toward fear. Goza writes, rather than defining fear so as to alleviate it, Hobbes advocated stoking fear and keeping it vague, for it is precisely vague fears that possess the greatest power. Anxiety produces the need for security, and the need for security inspires the embrace of tyranny. It is a powerful formula. In our day, fears of Muslims, immigrants, women, black men, liberals, you name it. Goza notes in particular how this formula has been used successfully by our own politicians, from McCarthy and Nixon, to Cheney and Rumsfeld, to Trump and Bannon. And behind the scenes throughout most of our time, he notes, was the figure of Roger Ailes, media mogul. In politics, Goza writes, propaganda matters. Too often when it came to politics, Christians who drank deeply from the Fox News fountain found a deeper political harmony with the fears and hatreds of Ailes than the self-sacrificial love of the politics of Jesus. A lot of us may feel like the America we once knew is in decline, like Zach at the Lincoln Project. But Joel Goza's analysis suggests that what we may in fact be witnessing is the unmasking of the America that has always been. And rather than seeing an increase in white supremacy and racism, we're actually seeing the most serious challenge to it. It's just that we didn't realize there was so much of it to challenge. But if this is so, what the elections point to is not an ominous decline but what might be a hopeful emergence of an opportunity for America once again to live up to her highest ideals. And where that leaves us today as the church is, as always, in the way of Jesus, who said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Let us pray. God, bless America, our poor, divided, struggling, yet beloved nation. We are afflicted with a deadly virus that continues to spread. We are afflicted with fear and suspicion and distrust of one another. Yet we continue to hold more in common with our fellow citizens than we have differences that divide us. Help us to move forward in faith, hope, and love. Help our leaders here in Hawaii, across our nation, and in our capital to have the wisdom, grace, and inspiration to begin to bridge our divides and to unite us in a common purpose for the life of the world. In the name of Jesus, who announced your kingdom's reign, amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you wherever you are and go with you wherever you go in the week to come. Amen.